Hello and welcome to Motoring First. Today we're going to be talking about, uh, well, I'm going to take things lighthearted now because as you know, when I get a little concerned about something, I get very serious. And today, right at the outset, I'm going to say I'm curious, I'm confused and I am concerned. We are talking about the TVS Apache RTR 310. When you said curious, confused and concerned, I thought we were talking about the Citroen C3. <laughs> that would have worked here as well. <laughs> what are you curious about? What exactly is it? So the 310 platform started with the two BMWs. Mm. They were priced, frankly, it was a silly price to start at. Mm. If you remember, that generation had vibration. Yeah. And it's not done too well for BMW, no matter how you paint it. But we'll talk about the sales numbers right at the end. Came TVS's version, which was the 310 RR, the sports bike, which actually did better than the BMWs. But that's obvious. It was also the less expensive bike. But I think TVS got the ignition maps and stuff right and they controlled the vibration better than the BMWs. And these ignition maps, as far as I can tell, went back to BMWs later and then those two bikes also become a little bit smoother. Nine years since they signed the agreement. Yeah. After that, they took about, I'm going to say three and a half years to actually produce the bike and mm. release it for sale. So we are looking at approaching 10 years of the project and seven years of these bikes. I, I remember the G310R being the one that first showcased the new engine and Correct. chassis and all of that. But in my head, in India, what we saw first? For, well, if you look at it in terms of sales, in terms of traction, in terms of what people seem to value, there is no doubt that the RR is the most important of all the right. 310s. To the point where then came the BMW 310RR. Right. Uh, the G 310RR. And the RR 310 is the TVS. They're the exact same bike. Hmm. But if you want the BMW badge, Hmm. You just pay more money. Uh, the only advantage you get is the BMW's color schemes are really nice. It is really a no, good looking... I think looking the badge itself is also really nice. It's true. <laughs> the uh, BMW's color schemes are much nicer than the TVS color schemes. The, it's not like the TVS is poor looking, but the BMW just looks one cut above. Hmm. And because BMW service is never crowded and it's hmm. a full-on premium experience, you get to pay roughly two times as much for the service, hmm. but they treat you nicely. I'm sure if you were to go to a TVS service center and say, I'll pay twice, they'll clear out the service center. Also. No, from whatever people are telling us about TVS service, there is nothing you can do with TVS service. Oh, yeah? It's very difficult. It's the brand that people complain about the most often in our comment stream. And now we are watching this for a year and a half. Right. I would say every week, three, four, five, eight people will show up, prompted or unprompted. So there is definitely a problem there. Mm. So that makes the RTR 310 the fifth motorcycle to come from this platform mm. in these seven odd years. Okay. For the first time, there is a major engineering change this time. Okay. So far, the bikes have basically been updated for emissions and stuff like that. And minor changes at best. Mm. Vibration being the biggest thing that they've attacked overall, if you think about it. Correct. This time, it's new. Okay, so the engine has a bunch of changes. There's a forged piston in there. There's a new airbox. There's a new exhaust system. So they're able to extract more power from this. So this 310 now makes 35 bhp when you... Oh, really? In max mode. Oh, where wow. it used to make 33, 34 bhp. It's not a big jump, but it is a difference. Ah, that's good. It's a gain. Huh? In the lower modes, you get, I think, 27 Newton meters of torque. In full torque mode, you get 28 Newton meters of torque. So performance has gone up a little bit. Hmm. The main core of the frame, the chassis geometry, etc., remains the same. Suspension remains the same. But the RTR 310 gets an aluminium subframe. Okay. But now you have two aluminium subframes on the on sale and one of them is the TVS. Mm -hmm. I would say the TVS frame is slightly better finished than the KTM frame in terms of okay. visual appearance and stuff. Okay. So the subframe is one change. The engine performance nature being changed. Why did they have to change the subframe? Any specific? I think it was just a styling thing and it's just a movement thing. Okay. I think uh, cast aluminium has become now close enough so that you can afford to do this. Okay. I think five years ago, if you were to tell an engineering team saying, can we have cast aluminum instead of a mm. tubular steam steel frame for this part or whatever, mm. I don't think they'd be able to afford the cost of it. Mm. I think it will go to other 310s also. Okay. The third part of it is that TVS has deployed a whole bunch of feature related items to this bike. I'm not sure that that is such a great idea, but they've done it and we'll discuss all of those parts one by one because there is some things in there which are terrific ideas, badly executed. Mm. Some ideas are very good and well executed. And some of it is part of what you already said, which is confused. Mm. Okay. So if you wanted to continue this and say, what does it actually do? If okay, I'll come <coughs> from my state of sure. partial confusion. The RR310 was already a very 
flexible motorcycle in the sense that it was not aggressive in terms of its seating posture. Correct. It was comfortable for everyday use. It was good for commuting, touring, all of that, right? It just happened to have a fairing on it. So sports tourer, yeah. right? How different is this in terms of how it rides? Uh, so handlebars a little bit higher. Okay. So you sit almost upright. It is still sporty. You're still canted forward a little bit, but it's going to feel more comfortable than a RR310. Mm -hmm. okay. We know that people who buy RR310s do take their motorcycles touring. Mm -hmm. So if they were to opt for an RTR310, in theory, at least the riding position will become a lot more comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're making a major change this time. Mm -hmm. So they've reorganized the design of this bike also. So if you remember, what we loved about the RR310's design was how simple the design was. Mm -hmm. And we did object a little bit to how rounded the panels were, which mm -hmm. TVS said was required for the top speed of this motorcycle. Now all of that has been thrown out of the window because the fairing is no longer there to help you with the top speed. Mm -hmm. So now it is a full-on street fighter in that sense. Mm -hmm. So to me, the headlights remind me of the old Suzuki SV1000. Okay. That kind of shape. But there are elements around the radiator which remind you of the Ducati Street Fighter. Yeah. Uh, in proportion, it is a pretty motorcycle, mm. but it is a really busy design. The color schemes, I don't think help this TVS as much as they could have. Mm. The yellow, which is their launch color, the yellow and gray, it's yellow and gray. And then there is the silver of the subframe, which is not the same gray as the paint. It's a little bit busy for me. Mm. Flip side, everybody notices this bike. Mm. So when you're outside riding, between the headlights, the two flat DRLs like that, mm. The headlight, the yellow, the grey, the sound of the bike is a really, really loud mm. bike. Everybody notices that you're coming. If you value that, this will be a good bike to own. If you don't value that, this bike is not going to be subtle. So the other day when the bike rolled into office, Shumi wasn't around and I was doing something. And the next thing I know, I see a crowd of people. I didn't know what had come in. There was a crowd of people and I couldn't see which motorcycle. And if I didn't know better, I would have thought it's... Uh, premium motorcycle like yeah. a Ducati or an Aprilia or something, something exotic has come yeah. in. But it had everybody in the office around it yes. and looking at it for a long time. Correct. And as usual, the attention to detail, it's good. Mm. Overall quality level, it's good. We mm. expect this from TVS. Yeah. They've delivered it again. I'm seeing TVS trend towards these weird color choices. Mm. I don't like it. Mm. I'm seeing TVS make these designs busier and busier. And I don't really like that either. Yeah, the if, busyness just doesn't work. Yeah, so if you look at the uh, trend of design, mm. I'm talking about, say, the second Victor. Okay. And the first Apaches, mm. where you could see the glimpses of a good design, but it was muddled mm. and unclear. Then they became sharper and sharper and sharper and super clear. I think something happened with the Ronin. Mm. And then the Ronin just went completely sideways. And I still think if they were to focus the Ronin, onto a scrambler, onto a cafe racer individually, there is a great line of products. Starting point for three different bikes exists. Yes. And what I'm saying, what I said just now is not originally my statement. Actually, he's, he's just forgotten that he said this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I'll take the credit. <laughs> so if you extend that line of thought, mm. this RTR 310 in a simpler, sleeker design might actually have been a better looking motorcycle. But if you are looking for attention, if you want to feel like I'm riding something large and premium and spacious or whatever, yeah, okay, fine. It works. Mm. To ride from the RR310 to the RTR 310, the vibration levels have gone up. That's not a good thing. Okay, I think there are two or three reasons why this is happening. First, I think they've raised the size of the rear sprocket by a small amount, so it's geared lower. So at highway speeds, this is a much noisier sounding bike. I'm not going to say it's strained, but with the earplugs in an hour and a half on the bike, I just felt like I was in a very loud place for a long time. There's a very distinct sound of this motorcycle when you're on it. Yeah, so not only is this engine has that specific sound, which I can't really classify as a good sound yeah. or a bad sound. It's somewhere in the middle. It's mechanical something. Yeah, and when I was riding the uh, BMW 310RR for our story, mm. uh, I'm going to say about a couple of months ago or a little bit before that, I remember that it was reasonably quiet and then there was a certain like 7,000 or something. And from 7,000 RPM, it was just like so much noise. Oh. And on the sports bike, because the fairing cancels some of the mechanical noises, mm. you get that sound of, oh, now we're going to go fast. Okay. I was a little bit disappointed because it's such a linear motorcycle that you don't actually have a step up in the performance. Mm. You just go a little bit faster. Oh. But I remember it as not so noisy first and then extremely noisy later. Okay. This motorcycle appears to make more noise constantly because partly low gearing. Mm. And I think they've raised the performance output of this engine. So it's the same engine, but now it's working harder. Mm. And I think that sense of strain comes out. Okay. So can you tour on this for a long distance sitting at say 100 kmph on the highway? Yes. Is this the quietest motorcycle you could sit at 100 all day on? Oh, absolutely not. 
I don't get this. Why has a naked become more aggressive than the sports bike? Uh, I'm assuming that when they did the engine, and I don't know this for sure. TVS hasn't confirmed this to us. But I'm assuming that when they raised the performance of this motorcycle, the feeling didn't come, so they had to lower the gearing also. Mm -hmm. And in the process of the combination, it has become a little too much. So I can't classify this as a refined motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Is does it have so much vibration that I'm saying just don't get one? No. But it's there. It's always there. Mm. And this motorcycle has been a this engine has been something with vibration from the very beginning. Yeah, they brought it in the control with the RR three ten to the best that we've seen. Mm. But this feels like a step back on that front. Some of that vibration is exactly where you'd be sitting on the highway. Oh, fifty five hundred to sixty five hundred, sixty seven hundred. I think is hundred uh, kmph and sixth. It's in that place that the vibration is at its maximum. And at that point, if you hug the motorcycle tightly, it's the tank. There's a little bit in the pegs, and there's quite a bit in the bars. Bars, yeah. Right. I rode. Uh, I'm going to say about 250 kilometers in the morning. We're recording this in the afternoon. Did my hands tingle from it? No. Mm. So did it cause actual physical discomfort in that sense? No. Mm. But that sense of it's at peace and mm. we are calm and we are easily cruising through the world didn't happen. And I think if you look at the stories that other guys did. Everybody has commented on how the vibration took a step back, mm. and I'm a little bit surprised that TVS would let that go, given the fact that the first wave of feedback for the three tens from both the brands was vibration, pro vibration. And it took them two iterations to get to a point where people were like, "Hey, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, exactly. Now we're fine exactly. somewhere there." Yeah, the increment in performance I like. Mm. It's still a very linear bike, so it mm. doesn't always tell you how fast you're going, mm. and it's not exciting in that sense. I remember riding the RR three ten race bike on a wet track day, and it was hilarious because on the race bike the gearing was very tightly placed together, so it would sound the same in every gear, and it mm. would sound the same at all revs. Mm. So instead of wow, it sound like ba 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 sixth. Mm. You know, it was very funny because you're going very fast, but you didn't have mm. a sense of it, mm. right? In the same way, this motorcycle is also super loud. I love the sound. <laughs> yeah, no, I I remember it because it had the open exhaust, right? So it was really loud. It was a wet day at Curry Motor Speedway, and it was a laugh because it, this chassis is such a beautiful chassis, right? Exactly. It had road fives, which are such tremendous rain tires. Amazing. So yeah. the combination was insane. I mean, I pushed that motorcycle in the rain as hard as I dared, and it never put a foot mm. wrong. So you're saying the actual speed is not feeling that. No, it doesn't feel exciting. You'll have to look down and say, "Oh, we're doing 130 now. Oh, we're doing 110. Oh, we're doing 80." So it's a little unplugged for me. I wish it was a little bit more feelsome on that front because the chassis actually is very feelsome. Mm. So the chassis, on the other hand, it does still have the road fives. Okay, mm. the road fives. I asked TVS a question. I haven't received a response yet. But uh, in January, I believe the Director General of Foreign Trade. DGFT, they added some of the Indian tire sizes into the import license restrictions, including okay. these front tire sizes for the KTM, for the Husqvarna, which is why I believe the Husqvarna no longer has Pirellis; they had to switch to Apollos. So they can't import these tires for sale in India. So I'm not sure what the source of the road fives are. I'm not sure again. Then TVS might have to switch. Which is not a crisis because Eurogrip, which is TVS tires, mm -hmm. Eurogrip makes the Protoc Extreme, which is a fantastic tire. We've tested it. I have it on my KTM. We tested it on the Aprilia RS four five seven. That story will come soon. Don't kill us uh, for mentioning it. But that's a fantastic tire. And if TVS were to move to the Eurogrip, I'd be totally okay with it. Yeah, right. So it does have road fives for now. Brilliant tire, dry, wet, both amazing. Yeah. The chassis is uh, very, very uh, talkative. It's feedback rich, and it's an uncomplicated, easy, natural feeling chassis. At no point do you think I have to do something, and then the chassis will respond. It mm. sort of knows what needs to be done. Do you feel different sitting on it because there's no fairing, and then I'm yes. guessing it's a wider, wider bar. Yes. So you feel different. It feels uh, more spacious in some ways. Mm. You feel more relaxed about it, and obviously the bars are higher. So the connected front end feel that you had on the RR310 that's taken back a little bit but do i still have a sense of i know exactly what the bike will do and the bike knows exactly what i would think it should do mm. yes still there still very much on it mm. it flows through fast corners very naturally uh, some of the stretches of the expressway where the highway and the expressway meet between pune and mumbai um, i was trying it a little bit today there was very light traffic in the afternoon in, in the heat and uh, no matter how fast you go The bike stays where it is. Bumps will upset it a little bit because this is a fairly stiffly damped setup. Oh yeah, it's not a stiff setup, but the damping is very stiff. Does it get BTO kit? We have the top model without the BTO kit. Okay. Okay. The variants have become a little bit confusing. So just to clarify, BTO was a 
variant of the RTR, RR310 that TVS had brought out, which is called Build to Order, which had two different packs, three different packs? Uh, yeah, so uh, they had two packs, now they have three. Oh, now they have three. Yeah, so you have three variants on the RR310. Oh, okay. Sorry, you have three variants on the RTR310. RTR there's the base model. Okay. Then there is the yellow one that we get, which is the top model, and there's a model in between. Okay. Uh, and above that are three BTO models. One of them is just a paint job, which is the Sepang paint job, which costs 10,000 rupees over everything else. Correct. And then you get the dynamic kit, which adds the suspension, the adjustable suspension and okay. all that. And you get the dynamic pro kit, which adds the IMU, so you can have conjuring ABS, conjuring traction control and a couple of other features. Okay. okay. If you add all of this up, it is a little bit more or less expensive than the KTM 390 Duke, which is why this has always been a slightly expensive motorcycle to purchase. The justifying the cost of this motorcycle has not always been simple. With the arrivals of bikes like the Triumph and the Hero Maverick and stuff, it's going to be even harder to justify some of this pricing. Mm. This one has the climate controlled seat, as TVS likes to call it, which is a seat with a heating function. What happened? I'm having uh, Tata vibes here. Please carry on. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, this time it is confusing. Tata and Hyundai. Th this time honest. it is so confusing that I've actually taken a screenshot of all the various <laughs> models and what goes into which one so that when you ask me this question, actually, let's do that right now only. <laughs> Before we got into this conversation, I just told him that this is somehow I'm, I mean, I've obviously not read up on what this bike is about so that we can have this conversation. But the sense I remember of the motorcycle from when it was launched was it's complicated and usually with motorcycles things are simple yeah right so uh, let's see um ours does have the quick shifter mm. and it's a really good quick shifter mm. it has tuning and calibration issues a little bit okay uh at part throttle loads you do expect quick shifters to not work too smoothly mm. this particular one especially under load almost never works fully smoothly it's not bad okay. but there is room for improvement here because you do get a joke from it so but under load you mean like part? uphill for example ah, okay so you've added a load by going uphill a little bit right you're not at full throttle but you're nearly at full throttle you'll still get a joke yeah. if it's a flat road near full throttle no joke mm. That's one. Second, when you're downshifting, this is a bi-directional quick shifter, when you're downshifting, it feels like the super clutch releases a little bit late. So you downshift and then it shifts, but then it freewheels a little bit and then you connect again to the performance. So it always has a little bit of a moment before, you know oh. how, so if you go down three times, yeah. you don't get three instant gear shifts. You get three gear shifts and then a lag and then it's back on. Oh, so really? I think they can tune that down a little bit further. Again, I'm not saying it's a terrible quick shifter. It's very slick. It mm. works beautifully. I never missed a shift. Mm. But I think there is room for a small amount of improvement there. And then it'll feel race tuned. Right now it is right. feeling like, okay, we tuned it to a level. And I know we've discussed this before, but we're used to TVS, you know, like geeking stuff out, right? Doing things to the nine yeah. tenths, ten tenths all the way through. So which is why these kind of things stand out when they are not done till that level. Yeah. And since we are on not done till that level, let's talk about that seat. Okay. The climate control seat, honestly, the way it has been done is just what's what's the word I want to use for it? Can I can I it's a prototype. Gimmick. It's it's a gimmick, partly yes. But the gimmick would also be okay if it didn't feel like a prototype that's been given to given for sale, okay? What they're using is something called the Peltier effect. And the simplest way to understand it, if you connect two wires of different metals and complete an electrical circuit, apply a voltage to it, one of these two places where the two metals meet will become hot and the other one will become cold. If you reverse polarity, which is take the battery and turn it around and pass the current in the other direction, then that thing will reverse. The first junction which was running cold will start heating up. The other one will start getting cold. TVS has used this very cleverly to create the idea that you can have three levels of hot or three levels of cold on the seat. The reason why this doesn't work is because the heating element is not as wide as the seat fully. So you can feel where the foam is and where the heating element starts. And underneath literally your balls as you sit on top of the heating element are the two hard points which are the fans which point downwards. Now, I don't like to sit that far back in the seat and on the TVS it is difficult because the pillion seat has a bump stop which sticks mm -hmm. out forward. So when you sit against it, my tailbone starts to hurt because I'm always against it. So you move forward. When you move forward, then the sit bones, which is if, if you're a bicyclist, you'd know sit bones instantly. But if you were to sit down on memory foam, two bones will actually carry quite of a load. They're called the sit bones. The sit bones go on top of the fans. Mm. So now you have literally no foam under you and it's a terrible way to sit. You could not get me to pay for this seat. Yeah. Okay. 
then comes the question of the gimmick because what actually happens is once before he goes there he's explaining what he experienced i've got to tell you what it felt like just as a bystander right he comes back and we're not discussing stuff but he says just check this out and i'm just feeling the seat and i kid you not your there are plates in the seat at that uh, slightly awkward position which can be felt very very clearly you can make out there are hard stubs of plastic right there and it's i don't bad, know yeah, how how bad. that could have gone through i just the idea of using that seat was like nah, i think i'm i'm fine i, I don't i really yeah. don't so want to first with the, whether you use the hot or cold or not the seat is compromised in terms of comfort you will not be able to tour on this seat there's no way to do it not unless you're uh, you're into pain mm. okay uh, now the second part of it is the gimmick part right mm. i didn't try the hot seat at all mm. i tried the cold and i left it on max cold because today morning as i left mumbai it was already 28 degrees and today when i rolled back in i think it was 37 right. 36 degrees something okay. like that it works for the first 5 minutes after that you're oblivious to whether the seat is cold or not i honestly shumi like for me this level of complexity in a mass market motorcycle is i think unwanted i think this needs to move forward into a shape where it gives your comfort where you have it today tvs doesn't make terrible seats at all this It's might actually fantastic seats yeah that's what this might actually be the worst seat i have ever seen from tvs in the entire history of my testing tvs vehicles agree i don't think you can adjust the levels once you're moving you have to stop to reset uh, i don't know traction control okay fair enough turn off abs i don't know why you would but okay fair enough i understand those yeah. but to my seat is now too hot no i functionally understand why you would have to stop to change traction control exactly. and abs let's say but why for the seat and every single motorcycle we've tested which has had heated grips or heated seats does not require you to stop to mm. do this except for the tvs which to me is a little bit strange hmm. since we were talking about the menus there are five riding modes urban rain sport track supermoto okay track and supermoto are effectively the same except supermoto for rear brake brake off ah, that's it yeah okay? okay so let's call it four you yeah. will see five screens and we'll come to the screens but we'll call it four so urban and rain use the same engine setting this is the 27 bhp engine setting in terms of torque peak torque is different by 1 newton meter but it's at the same rpm okay but the 27 uh, bhp happens a lot earlier than the 36 bhp so there is a quite a big difference in how it feels when you ride urban mode engine versus easy sport mode engine yeah it's calmer it's gentler it feels nice okay did it feel much slower yes it did did i get bored of it yes but there's no rain today so there was no challenging conditions for me to need to go slower i was mm. just trying it out so mm. i'm assuming in the rain new rider yes it might work and the difference is finally big enough remember when tvs had done riding modes for example street and race on the end talk i couldn't tell why i'd had to be in the street at all hmm here there is a difference so hmm. we are okay they both use the same traction control setting which is the urban traction control setting right. and in terms of abs there is a difference urban abs and rain abs right got it we are good so far what you should know is this bike has traction uh, cruise control right but cruise control is only available in urban out of these two modes in rain mode you cannot have cruise control Don't ask me why; it makes no sense to me. Whatever, we'll we'll talk about cruise control. It's actually a really good system. Now, sport mode, track mode, and super moto mode all use the full power 35 bhp engine. Mm. It's the same engine setting, so it's not like one is more aggressive or less aggressive. It's the same setting. I somehow felt that sport mode had a little less vibration than track mode, but I think it's just me. There mm. is no difference in the tuning of the setup. Okay. All three use the same traction control setting, also, which is the sport traction control setting. Mm. There is a difference in the ABS setting here. Mm. So the sport mode uses the urban ABS, the track mode uses track ABS, super mm. moto mode uses track ABS with the rear off. Are we good so far? If I were to approach that bike, I wouldn't know how to get my head around it, right? I mean, as of no, so you would only select from one of the five modes, right? That's all. Correct, but I can I can't change any of those. So you no, just, this is not user settable. This is how it is. This okay. is just the matrix of what is going to happen with you. Okay. So it's not like I can say, can I get super moto mode with? No, you can't. Okay. You select super moto or you select something else. Period. So complexity on paper is a lot more than complexity while riding. So okay, let's simplify this. So default mode for most people will be sport. I think so. Yeah. And I think unless you are extremely cautious or whatever. uh the urban mode will be good for rain as well i am I mean, saying most people would choose between sport and urban throughout the year 
right. if you're worried about the rain or you feel like your confidence level has not come up and this is a confident motorcycle chassis mm-hmm. wise yeah. if you don't think your confidence has come up you'll switch to rain mode we will establish this at the test but okay. today i have no comments to make on the traction control because i never saw that light come on while i was looking for it and the other time if it did i didn't realize it so either it is invisible or it didn't work i don't know and anyways the chassis suspension everything it was it's very very, very composed it's very composed it doesn't upset you at all ah, okay okay now the Coming same to cruise control cruise no control. wait hang on oh, wait. this is just the basic ones when you add the built to order models with the imu then more or less the same matrix remains but remember now the traction control is lean sensitive and cornering abs is also lean sensitive engine settings haven't changed they remain where they are traction control settings haven't been changed they remain where they are but now they are lean sensitive i'm still not clear about who this bike is for i think this is a technology demonstrator a lot more than this is a bike for people to buy in some ways Because but we'll we'll talk about the context of this bike in a bit okay no worries we'll come back to it next is cruise control yeah I wish the switch for the cruise control was a little bit better because okay. it moves forward and backward but you can't really feel whether it engaged or not. So I did make a mistake a couple of times where I not only reset it but mm-hmm. I also added one number to the speed that I wanted to go at without mm-hmm. realizing it. Mm-hmm. But there are some really good ideas in there. Mm-hmm. So you can click up and down once you've once you've switched on cruise control you can click up and down and add speed like normal but if you hold it increments in increments of 5. A lot of cruise control systems just start the count faster mm. i think 5 is a far far superior way to do it mm. it's also a flawless system it works you can upshift and downshift during cruise control oh nice that which is, is the perfect. first time i saw it on what on the ducati multistrada v4s so this is a very high order of equipment in that sense what well it, thought out yeah what it doesn't do is if you're let's say in fourth and the cruise control speed that you've set is not possible in fourth mm. then it gets all the way to the red line and then it says rider take control instead of upshift now yeah. so i wish it would prompt you to upshift yeah. rather than to say okay i don't know what the hell to do <laughs> next you take over right but otherwise mm. it works you can downshift you can upshift uh, you can disengage using a negative throttle they have okay. a little bit of a negative throttle you can use it to disengage you can touch the brake clutch you can resume perfect but that switch is not positive enough so you okay. don't feel it move forward and click okay. and you don't feel it move back and click okay. that's all i would change got it you don't get a click out there you don't get a click okay. but uh, cruise control is a fantastic system and to me if you're buying a bike in this class you should expect cruise control because as much as it sounds like india doesn't have the roads for it as our highways become better and they will become straighter as they become straighter sitting like this for an hour will become boring cruise control is a much better way to do it it doesn't mean release your hands mm. because motorcycles wobble your hands are required to damp that resonance out on all naked motorcycles don't take your hands off but cruise control does allow you to sit with the hand resting on the throttle grip rather than actively actively using the throttle grip so it helps so good cruise control system i'm happy that they put it uh, also if your bike hits reserve you can't use cruise control anymore now the cruise uh, the range when you hit reserve might be as much as 70 km 65 km but good luck you cannot use cruise control anymore the screen itself is terrible i think tvs is that vertical screen no thankfully no but uh, tvs has started to clutter their graphics and add a lot of equipment again there are some really good ideas in there but there's some really strange execution in there so for example uh, most of the ducatis and aprilias which have these kind of complicated layouts they still use one layout Mm. and then they change color highlights to show you you are in sport mode or you are in urban or touring or whatever mm. right tvs uses a completely different screen so if i am in rain mode or uh, urban mode i think the radiator heat uh, readout and the fuel gauge readout stay in the same place and then you go into sport mode and it's a completely different screen actually the best screen of the lot is the sport mode because it has the least going on mm. so now you have a central speedometer readout and you have uh, two arrows like this one being the fuel gauge and one being the radiator temperature mm. coolant temperature right the supermoto mode looks the same with a little piece of text that says abs <laughs> rear abs is off and now there is a mountain in the background as a line drawing i'm not sure why and track mode has twin uh, tachometers with a big uh, numeric readout for the revs in the middle the speedo moves to this side and becomes smaller the gear indicator moves to that side and becomes smaller what do you mean twin tachometers it's two lines and the revs move across in graphics oh, okay right what i'm saying is i'm not sure why every screen has to have a new graphic because basically the first half an hour of my ride i kept looking down to figure out yeah, where I are my numbers at mm. but the good idea in there is that your other auxiliary information is organized as custom widgets four of them and you can select what you'd like to see okay thankfully they haven't put it to the complexity level of saying in each mode you can select which custom 
widget should appear mm. uh, that would have been too complicated but on the way back when i hit reserve i said mm, i'd like to see uh, my range instead mm. so you can see the range if you go in one screen or you can stop and i had to stop so i stopped and then you can set it as a widget so it permanently displays that but it's reporting some performance data for you it's mm. reporting your top speed and stuff uh, it reports lap times and track mode and stuff Mm. So there's a lot going on and TVS likes to add a lot of graphics on top and then they want to do different screens for every mode. By the end of it, it's a little bit of a mess. What I would suggest is a much simpler layout. Don't use colors just because it's a color screen. Use them to highlight the important information and then use the color highlights to distinguish between modes. But I think this is a bad way to move forward in terms of the UI UX experience. What I don't like about this entire conversation, it seems like there's a shift happening at TVS about who they are. Yes. And that is the worrying part and i think tvs does need to shift but i think the transition is not going as smoothly as we would hope from the outside because to me they are a engineering first company that does quality products they do great engineering and they do great solutions to actual problems and yeah. it's beginning to appear like we are throwing gimmicks and features out and in the process some of the engineering is being held back and i'm not sure why right uh, just to complete the picture of the motorcycle so that we can move on from here it's a really nice motorcycle in the ways that we remember it being a nice motorcycle so the chassis the brakes the ride quality to me most people will think it's a little bit too firm i cannot call this a super plush comfortable motorcycle i think for example uh, the duke 250 on the one side which has non adjustable suspension it will feel more pliant mm. and the ktm 390 which at the BTO price also has adjustable suspension will feel more comfortable or more sporty depending on your setting but both will feel like superior setups than the base setup of the motorcycle we've got with the non adjustable it's just a little too stiff for my taste i wish they just calmed it a little bit uh, and to me a good reference point for the kind of ride quality i would expect is actually the TVS Ronin mm -hmm. except that the Ronin sort of loses control at higher speeds i'd like the control to be retained but the Ronin feels like a plush sweet motorcycle at the bottom Mm. and i would like the rtr310 to start at that and then ramp up to be a slightly sportier bike this remaining in the rr310 zone i don't think is healthy for this bike and also for anybody designing naked i just would like to give you a parallel you know when we got the z1000 from kawasaki in the z800 for us in india i i i get it that there is an idea of a ducati street fighter which is this angry naked motorcycle and is just mad but for most of us using naked here in india you want you still want plurality right yep. and you'd want more than what you would see with a exactly. fared motorcycle right and like the z1000 for instance would it even at 110 kilometers and i used to feel like eh, you just could not relax with that motorcycle yep. which is why i always preferred i mean the, as no no worse we'd gone for a ride together with the ninja 1000 the z1000 and the z800 mm. uh, colleagues on the way back nobody wanted the z1000 and i ended up riding it uh. and the ninja 1000 had been crashed earlier and it was bent uh. it wouldn't turn left and still people despite which somebody wanted to ride that and not touch the z1000 yeah. so i don't get it when a naked is becoming that much more aggressive especially when you already have a fared motorcycle which yeah. is a sibling for that make that racier make that sportier this let it be more flexible yeah and, and in fact now i'm thinking that when this engine goes back to the rr310 as inevitably it must right you'll have a committed motorcycle and an uncommitted motorcycle in riding position terms but most of the experience will actually be the same and i don't know that that's enough differentiation between these two products or not what they going to take this engine it has to i mean logically it has to because this is the first time they've mechanically updated this motorcycle in any way at all in all of these years right yeah now in terms of context sorry that's a lot to yeah in, in terms of context you should know that this project is almost 10 years old now uh the first four years was basically engineering then the bikes came out three and a half odd years so these are now really old bikes except for the rtr310 obviously and uh, for all of the time that has been spent for all of the attention that these bikes get they haven't actually done much if you think about it uh, sales so far have been about 500 units a month tvs's number was i think 7000 units a year or 6000 6 to 7000 units a year uh, bmw's figure for 2023 global was 28000 motorcycles now 28000 motorcycles is something bmw is calling amazing this is the company that sells 60000 R1200 GSs, R1250 GSs, R1300 GSs, the adventure model, etc. Okay, so think about it. <laughs> Their flagship GS sells two times the total number of 310s that they've sold globally, which does make no sense at all, right? 
TVS is hoping that the RTR 310 will double their sales here, which amounts to a thousand motorcycles a month between the RR 310 and the RTR 310, which honestly is not a big number either. But it doesn't seem likely either. Uh, I don't know. Look, the, I mean, the, the, the signs on the basis of what you look, described. The, the, the signs aren't good, right? Because this bike came out in what August, September, something like that last year. I haven't seen one yet. I haven't seen one yet either. So he's mostly in Pune, I am mostly in Mumbai and neither of us have actually seen a bike out on the street yet. Uh, and Mumbai usually shows up new bikes pretty, pretty rapidly. Mm. And we haven't seen a single one yet, so that's not a good sign. And we are six months in. There have been delays at TVS too. Because mm. if you remember the Thai thing happened, they came back, then there was a lot of silence. And then the test bikes only started rolling out a month and a half or two ago. So TVS has also been unable to meet their own deadlines more recently. If you mm. look at it, the IQ ST is still missing in action. Hmm. The TVS X announcement happened, first ride happened, uh, and then nothing happened so far, right? So TVS also has delays going on. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen anything yet. But most importantly, if you were to ask me a question tomorrow saying, should I buy the RTR 310 based on my experience, I'm going to definitely ask you to go get a test ride. Hmm. But is it an automatic? Yep, that's a great bike. You should get one. I'm sorry, but it's not. The refinement, I'm going to say no, get the RR. No, because, yeah, because the refinement is going to get in your way. And as much as this motorcycle feels faster than the RR310 in some ways, it doesn't feel pleasant because of that vibration and that noise and how loud it gets as you go, try to go faster. Gr motorcycles with grunt, which rev fast, which feel like they're running out of revs, often don't need shorter gearing. They need taller gearing. So they feel more relaxed. You have more freedom with how you use the power. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, so this is a difficult one to recommend. We will test it fully. We've only tested 250 kilometers mm. out today. Okay, My first point. impression is, okay, I'm mm. not blown away. The gimmickiness of this motorcycle is to me a negative. There's also a headlight, for example, that has three levels and then it switches from one level to the other depending on your oh, speed. Oh yeah, it has some dynamic beams, right? Yeah, so uh, it has one setting up to 80, then from 80 to 100, I think it has the middle setting, which it defaults to if you turn this automatic headlight thing off. Okay. And then there's the brightest setting which you can access above 100 kmph. How are the beams? I haven't tested it yet, okay. full, full daylight. Uh, okay. I intend to take the motorcycle home tonight, so I'll find out what these headlights do. But uh, should a headlight have stepped levels at all? I'm not convinced. I mean, remember when the Chetak used to have a continuously variable headlight and we laughed about it, <laughs> right? The horn would also have continuously variable tonality <laughs> and the headlight had continuously variable illumination. Yeah. We weren't kicked about it. Hmm. So if this motorcycle is able to give me max illumination hmm. at 100, assuming that it obviously meets all the laws, which hmm. means it's not blinding people in low beam, etc, etc. Hmm. Why wouldn't I just have that the whole time? Hmm. Who has ever complained about having too, too much, much light yuck. in the night, right? So we can't seem to get a two-wheeler with a decent headlight. And now TVS has made really good LED headlights. Mm. Why does the RTR have to have steps in the headlights performance? I don't understand it. Why can't I just get the max performance possible? So, hey car guys, if you're looking for a motorcycle, you know, this is where you should start. You'll, <laughs> you'll feel at home <laughs> making these decisions. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so this is more or less the whole picture of this. Mm -hmm. uh, as a project, if you think about it, uh, my personal opinion is that this bike shouldn't have been a 310 in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think when they started this project, 310 seemed like a good idea because the 250s were beginning to take root. But what was supposed to be the 250s became the 400. Yeah. And at that point, they sort of left this 310 behind. Mm -hmm. But seven years is a long time to recover from that. We haven't seen any movement from either of the two partners to move the displacement up. But if you look at it, uh, can you call the Speed 400 under-equipped? You can't. But that's only 2 lakh 30,000 rupees today. Let's assume Triumph is losing some money on it. Okay, no stress. 400X, it has longer travel suspension. It still has a 400cc engine. It has basic traction control. Mm. Then you come to the other side where you load the BTO, etc, etc up. And now you can buy a 35 BHP bike with adjustable suspension and uh, IMU and all of this for the same price as a 45 BHP bike. Uh, it doesn't compute. Yeah, which is the thing, right? Because I think they have ended up confusing me at least because they're trying to hedge themselves from these rivals by saying that the price starts at two point whatever so that it seems far, away, far enough yeah. from these names and brands, yeah. right? So it seems like a viable proposition. Yeah, but see, if you would take the approach of the Apple approach of making a ladder, and you say that my ladder starts at 243 and my ladder extends all the way to 310, it still doesn't make sense. The steps don't make sense. I agree. I'm saying it doesn't make sense. Yeah. 
which is why all these options should have been options. They should have just been, okay, three motorcycles and this is what it is, done. Yeah. Okay, with yep. traction control, with IMU, with uh, yep. adjustable suspension. These are my three and Correct. we're done. And we're done. Yeah, I think it would have made the model line a little bit simpler for sure. I also think that it's a little bit difficult to understand because I think TVS themselves are going through a fairly important transition right now. Uh, there's a young CEO who's taken over. Mm. I think Sudarshan is finding his feet. Mm. There's a whole bunch of new people in the top management who are not up coming up through the TVS ranks. They've been brought in from the outside. So they bring their own personas. They bring their own perspectives. And I don't think they fully understand what TVS's brand has represented up to this point. Because TVS to us was a very special brand in the sense of they were very quiet about what they did. They let the engineering talk for itself right. and they were proud of the fact that their engineering would connect the dots for you as you rode the bikes. Mm. And the engineering was the core of that organization in many ways. They are the one bunch of people I loved meeting because they were just full of motorcycling and they were all riding. Right. Absolutely. So this is what the culture of this organization is. This is why they were racing. I mean, I'm not clear why they were at the Dakar at all, but I know that that's naturally something that they would pull off. Right. Mm. Today, we are talking about features. We are talking about bright colors. Bright colors are not really a TVS thing for me. Mm. And now I, I can understand that TVS is going through a transition and they'd like to be a, let's say, a more talked about brand. But I think that can't be done at the expense of who they were already. You, you can slowly take your brand to a new place, but you can't make a harsh transition like this happen overnight. And I don't think it will work straight away. I think that has to be treated as a base. And on top of that, you build, you yes. don't take away from this. Yes. And I think the native goodness of what TVS has been doing is why TVS has become who they are. They didn't become number three because they advertised heavily. They didn't become number three because uh, they gave humongous discounts everywhere. They didn't become number three because the gimmicks worked. Right. They became number three because the products fundamentally worked. And even today, you ride an Entoc, you ride a Jupiter, you ride the RTR 160, you ride the RTR 200. These four are phenomenal products. It's very hard to find fault. And TVS does what I feel like stupid sometimes, right? I benchmark, I benchmark, I benchmark, I make the last product in the segment. But they were so good at it. That is really hard to argue against that as a strategy. They would make the best 160 even if it came last. And mm -hmm. when the Pulsar guys faltered, TVS came and took that position as the market leader. It is unheard of. Nobody has done it before. Yeah. Right? The Jupiter is the only commercially successful massive number two in any segment at all in this country. There are no other massive number twos in this country. Mm. Their products did the talking for them. And if you look at it from that perspective, this RTR 310 does not fit into that continuum. So things are changing at TVS. And I understand transitions are difficult, but I don't think this level of gimmickry is required. Right? I think what we're trying to say is we have respected TVS for what they do and what they've done so well. And which is to build motorcycles that talk to riders who convince them to get one and to ride them. Right. And I think that has to be the base on which future TVSs have to be built rather than at the expense of it to make them seem modern or more vibrant. Uh, by way of features or technology or whatever. Technology has to improve the experience, not get in the way of it. And Yeah, I, I said it in a few episodes ago, I think. Equipment is what equipment does. Mm. I don't need it to have fancy things. And yeah, so which is why this for me was a confusing product. And I, was, yeah, I think it still is. is uh, I was concerned about it. I just hope that whatever comes next is good old TVS. Would you like to do a quick summary now? Oh my God, no. No, no, you're required to. It's part of the format. Everybody loves quick summaries. All right, let's do this. I'll help you. I'm going to leave you in the lunch. There's a lot to unpack <laughs> this, here. This, this, yeah. I need the cheat sheets. All right. Uh, TVS's Apache RTR 310 is the latest in the whole 310 family. It started off with the G310R and went to the RR310 and then all the other in-betweens. And finally, this is one motorcycle which has got a significant update even in terms of its engine. It gets a forged piston now. There are a lot of details that we haven't spoken about. But basically, it's the same motorcycle in terms of its chassis, its suspension, and uh, the geometry and all of that. The difference is, of course, its design, which is uh, quite dramatic and uh, quite busy. But typical of TVS, it is well made. It's got design themes coming. I think in the headlamps, I feel there's a connect to the radar in terms of the uh, the shroud for the uh, 
the radiator and that entire belly section has the Ducati Street Fighter vibe to it. Uh, so it's got a lot happening. Uh, gets attention. Not exactly pretty, right? Um, so coming back to its naked form, it's different from the RTR 310 because the handlebar is more up, sorry, higher up. Yep. And uh, it's wider as well. A little bit. A little bit wider. So you get a more upright stance. It, dis it does reduce some of the feel you get from the front end, but not significantly. This is still, like we said, the same chassis. Uh, and that works beautifully. It still gets the Michelin Road 5 tires, which somehow TVS are still managing to get for the their motorcycles here. Which we, No, we have to confirm whether they will continue to or not, because this thing has just happened. Right. As we are recording this, this, there's a little bit of confusion. Bajaj told us they are clear that they're not going to be able to source the Pirellis for the Husqvarna, which is where the question came from. I did ask TVS. They haven't responded yet. If the response comes before this video is released, I'll put it on the screen. Uh, it should be lighter. The suspension has not been retuned, but it feels more firmly damped. So you feel more of the road surface as it's going over. Not uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for other reasons, but not because of the suspension. And coming to the discomfort aspect, there's this seat with the cooling and heating function, which Shumi tried out. And for the first five minutes, you could feel the cooling effect, but after that, nothing really. And that seat, the way it's designed, the materials that it needs to cool your ass uh, makes you a bit... I love how you struggle with that word. <laughs> makes you a bit uncomfortable because there are really hard bits right there. Um, an unneeded little bit of complexity. That in my sentence books. is going to get your comments. Uh, what? There are really hard bits that right there. Okay. Uh, I got yeah. you. <laughs> right. So that's the seat part of it. Aside from this, it's got lots more tech and options that you can configure and choose from. For instance, it gets traction control as standard, but you have the option of an IMU system, which will give you lean sensitive traction control and ABS. Um, you also get the BTO options, which is a special livery, Sepang livery, which is one of the options. Yeah. And uh, you also get the adjustable suspension as an option, right? Um, Aside from that, the engine itself, aside, uh, okay, aside, <laughs> so I've gone back to the engine. So yeah, the engine, aside from the forged piston, it actually does make more power. It's 35 PS now, Roughly. which is uh, about one and a half, two PS more than before. Yeah. Um, it has five modes as such. Yes. Ride modes, mm -hmm. but uh, two tunes for the engine. Correct. And it has... Three tunes for the ABS, yes. Rain, Urban and Sport and uh, the engine has basically just two tunes which is Urban and uh, Sport. Urban is 27 horsepower and uh, of course track is 30, I mean Sport is 35 horsepower and you can use them in five different configurations including a supermoto mode where uh, the rear ABS, rear ABS is delinked and you also have a Sport or track ABS. Is it track ABS or yes. sport? Track, track, track. Sorry, track sorry you're right. Track ABS. Yeah, track ABS, oh. which is the most lenient, and of course, rain is the most aggressive. So, of the modes, the simple takeaway is don't bother with all of them. For most usage, urban will be good enough. And for most people, actually, sport will be the happy place to be in. Yeah, and, and it's a non aggressive power curve. Hmm. It's a very peaceful, linear, I'm not saying slow, but peaceful right. linear motorcycle. So, I would just stick it in sport and call it done. I've probably never come out of that mode. Right. If this motorcycle had big steps in power or the chassis wasn't as good as it was, then the role of traction control in the rain, for example, or if it had really much poorer tires, which it doesn't, then all of these things would be a lot more critical. Correct. But the chassis is so good. If this bike was completely non-electronic, I think you'd go the same pace everywhere. This is, see, this is the beauty of great engineering. When you have good engineering, all the others become optional. Yeah. When the basic engineering is not good, then you need all the other surrounding bits yep. to make it work. And this is a good motorcycle as a base. And so it just works. Yeah. Right. Uh, so when you get to riding it, it's a quick motorcycle, quick enough, but it just does feel a bit loud. It could be because the fairing is no longer there. Um, no, it was loud before the fairing also. Okay. Now it is louder. Okay. It's louder. Yeah. So see, the 310 has never been a quiet motorcycle Correct. when you're trying to go fast. This is just loud. Hmm. And I think part of it is the extra strain from the extra performance coming. Hmm. Part of it is that there is no fairing to take away some of the sound from you, as it were. So, going at 110 kmph down the highway, it is loud. And I'm saying with your plugs loud. I'm hmm. not saying without your plugs loud.
So uh, remember that this is a reverse inclined engine. It's the engine actually slopes backwards. So I think that always throws a bit more sound towards you. Perhaps, Anyways, yeah. uh, so this, so basically it's a motorcycle that can move fast, but does it feel satisfying while it's doing that? Is it something you enjoy? Not, not really. Much. Right. Not so and much. the vibrations, n not that Shumi saying that they're a deal breaker, but they're there. Right. And vibrations was an issue with this motorcycle right from the start, which TVS took three iterations to fix on this motorcycle, on the RR310, step by step, to a point where people stop talking about it, right? right? It stopped being an issue, a discussion point for somebody looking to get exactly one of these right. TBSs, yep. right? But we've taken a step back on this front and that is a big deal because that, like we said, was a deal breaker for people, yep. right? Um, aside from that, the motorcycle is planted, it's confident, it feels great to ride in, in the way it handles. Uh, Shumi really liked even some of the features like the uh, the cruise control, which was easy to modulate yep. on the go. Yep. Um, nearly perfect. Nearly perfect. Like Yeah, he compared yep. it to the Ducati system, which allowed you to make gear changes while uh, using cruise control and easy to go on and off uh, to switch it on and off as well. Uh, aside from that, it gets adaptive headlamps, right? What is it called? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, something like that. Dynamic headlamps. And dynamic headlamps, yeah. Remember their BMW's partner, so the word dynamic and dynamic pro will appear rather than adaptive. All uh, right, so yeah, so it's got three levels of brightness depending on, you have to select it, right? Automatic is speed oriented, manual is only the middle setting. Okay, fine. So there's automatic and manual. That's right. Um, pricing is a concern because it starts off at 2.4 or something, 2.4 something, and it goes all the way up to Duke 390 with all the options. And uh, the Duke 390 has a lot more performance. Yep. And uh, by default, its suspension setup is also more comfortable. In fact, since TVS likes to benchmark, the new 390's base setup is actually an excellent, aggressive uh, street bike setup. It the, the feelings that you get from it, spot that on. suspension is spot on. Yeah. Right. So what else is remaining now? Now we'd like to see a change. <laughs> no, have I finished the summary? I'm not no, sure. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. Yeah, we're yeah. good. Oh, the bike okay. has been available uh, for a while now. I believe deliveries have not so long ago started. Hmm. Uh, we haven't seen one yet. We are a little bit concerned about that. Um, and this motorcycle will now go back to TVS and hopefully it'll come back and then we can properly test it and put it through a usual sequence of tests. Yeah. Then we'll have a more firm opinion. But is this a great start for the RTR 310? And not as great as I was, as I was hoping for, no. But if, again, if you're correlated to the media reviews that we saw from Thailand, if you're correlated to what has happened since the bikes went to uh, media houses, the way they've tiptoed around this bike, the way they've hedged their verdicts, it's not looking good. Yeah, I'm a little bit sad. So just to give you a parallel, right, when we first rode the RR310, did we not feel the vibrations? We did. Right, we did, but we really enjoyed riding that motorcycle yeah. in so many other ways. And for that time, it was, it was a disruptor. Right? You know, that's a great point. You know what? I think that this RTR 310 had it come out, let's say, four years ago or three years ago. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't complain. Yeah. You'd be like, yeah, this is fine. But in the last year and a half, and especially the last six months, We've just moved parameters left, right and center. And just like I think happened at the beginning of this project where the 250s were there, they thought we'll make a 310 so it'll have more CC, etc. But the 400s happened, 350s happened. I think the same thing has happened again in some ways. Yeah. This bike is not as smooth as many of its competitors. It doesn't have the suspension comfort of many of its competitors. Many of its competitors use less technology, but they use it for more effective uh, rider benefits. Right. And when you add the sum total up and put the price into it, suddenly it looks like the timing went wrong. Not the motorcycle as much. The timing went wrong. It would have been fine a couple of years ago, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Today I'm thinking about if I wanted to recommend a really comfortable motorcycle to you, I'd look at Maverick, 400X, Himalayan, 390, 250, 250. Yeah, that's what. So there's so many of them that mm -hmm. have such good suspension setups yeah. now that this TVS suddenly looks like an older setup. Mm -hmm. It's not bad, but it's not as good as what's currently very good, right? But there are smooth engines out there, right? In terms of technology, uh, cruise control is the only one thing that all yeah, of these guys seat. have missed. Don't forget the seat. Yeah, yeah, no wait. Cruise control is the only thing which the 
uh, TVS has, TVS does really well, and I wish that the Himalayan had, for example. Ah. I would love to have it on the 390 Duke also because I think that bike also makes a good tour, right? So, slightly underwhelmed, honestly. But I think this is a part of the history of this project from the beginning anyway. I'm surprised that they haven't moved forward. And I think that this RTR 310 should have straight away been an RTR 450 and then this whole discussion would be completely different. Maybe it's the BMW contract that doesn't allow TVS to do the 450 by themselves. And BMW have to come on board and do the 450 with them. Mm. And BMW already had a massive failure in the single 450, it was called the GX or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And that bike absolutely bombed. So maybe now BMW has a thing about that displacement class. Maybe BMW should listen to TVS this time. For these kind of displacement, TVS just knows a heck of a yes. lot more than BMW. I think BMW has gotten it wrong more often in this class than, BMW, uh, than TVS ever has. You guys should do one thing, okay? Um, just go out. I, I don't know when it was launched. Uh, the G310 GS when it came out, you have to check out the European or the American reviews of the G310 GS when it came out, okay? Basically, people over there are so not used to riding single-cylinder motorcycles that they have no reference points. Yep. And when people wrote them back, that they were like, wow, this is so refined. Wow, this... And I was just like, what? What's, yeah. what's going on here? So, when we are saying, let TVS do this, is because TVS does this for a living. And if you need any example of this, the RTR 164V for, I mean, it was brilliant from the, from, is, I mean, I haven't written the newer version, is, which is why I'm saying, ah, great. But the point is, it is so good that people actually complain when we first wrote it, that it's too smooth, right? Yeah, so yeah, 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 TVS yeah, yeah. can go to yes. that limit, yeah, yeah. right? So if you have to do another version of this and the next generation should come, mm -hmm. uh, TVS, please take it on. Yeah, in fact, if, if I remember correctly, the 310 engines, mechanical engineering is, I think, Munich. Hmm. And therefore, TVS had to step in and do the ignition maps and calm the vibration down. Uh -huh. Because uh, look, it's not like BMW doesn't know how to make smooth engines. BMW doesn't know how smooth an engine needs to be to be acceptable to Indians. And we come from low power, unstressed singles, which are very smooth, including yeah. TVS's own. <laughs> yeah. And then suddenly when there's a amount of vibration, you're like, whoa, what happened here? Doesn't Think about work. it. We've talked about vibration for the Duke 390. We've talked about vibration for the Duke 250, for the Himalayan, for the 400X and the speed. Can I not live with any four of these motorcycles? easily but our reference point is not vibration our reference point is the lack of vibration Correct. that's what we are looking for as usual if there's any questions that you'd like us to answer that we haven't touched upon please leave us a comment they don't have to be about the rtr 310 we try and answer almost all of our comments we're working out a way where we can more accurately answer your comments you'll see that uh, thing soon uh, but in the meantime we do the best we can and uh, thank you so much for all the comments you do leave us it's amazing uh, this podcast will also appear on Apple, Spotify, Amazon and Google if you'd like to listen to it instead. And as usual, uh, tell your friends who are trying to listen to this episode and don't quite have the patience yet. There is always a quick summary at the end, uh, which they can always use to access a more condensed version of the full episode. I'm telling you that at the end last time, because when I started at the beginning last time, all of you said, what are you talking about? It, the length is fine. People took offense. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, most of you appreciate the length of the content and we love you guys for that. But there are some of them who have come new to the system and they can't understand why we talk an hour about a bike. We love it. You love it. But they're still a little bit outside the system. Let's help them out a little bit. Thank you so much.